Thank you for joining us today at Discovery Park of America. I'm Katie Jarvis from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. I will be your host for this and other lessons with professors from the University of Tennessee at Martin. These lessons are for students in grades six through nine, but they will be of interest to anyone. Today, we will be talking with Dr. Tim Daysinger, an assistant professor of health and human performance at UT Martin. We will explore the psychological and sociological benefits of participating in physical activity. So Dr. Daysinger, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Katie. Let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, absolutely. All right, go ahead and share this little presentation I've got for us. So like Katie mentioned, we're gonna focus on the psychosocial benefits of physical activity. So for this lesson, there's three main objectives. First, we're gonna define and then look at the different benefits of participating in physical activity. And then looking more specifically at the psychological and sociological benefits, we'll focus on how much activity is necessary to see mental health improvements. And lastly, we'll look at different aspects of social support and how that can help us maintain a life, lifetime of physical activity. So what is physical activity? Well, physical activity, a lot of people think is exercise and that is one part of it, but it's so much more than that. So physical activity really includes anything we do that requires energy. So things like walking the dog, that's included. Yes, traditional exercise, sport, for sure, but there's really four main categories that we look at uh, physical activity behavior. So the first would be leisure time. And this is what we typically think of. We think about going to the gym, going for a jog, absolutely. Anything we do in our free time, that all counts in that leisure time activity. Then the second category would be household. So vacuuming, things that we all love to do, those are included and things like gardening, those can be pretty vigorous activities. So those would all be in that second category within the household. The third would be activity for transportation. And if you lived in a big city like New York, Chicago, you'd probably get a lot of time in that transportation category. But in more rural areas, probably not as often get as many minutes within that category, but surely in the fourth, especially for middle school, hopefully we're getting some quality physical education and all that time would be included in school. And then in the workforce, also if you have a more kind of hands-on job, anything you do at the workplace. And now corporate wellness is becoming more popular, more opportunities in that area where large corporations are really trying to promote during the workday being more active and some even go as far as offering gym memberships for the different workers. So we're doing a lot better. We're kind of understanding this is really important for us and we'll look at some reasons why. So what's recommended? Well, for adults, we're recommended to get 150 minutes per week of physical activity. And a lot of that typically is more aerobic based activities. So like that leisure time exercise, those household activities, and it's all an amalgamation of the whole week. And we used to have this stipulation where you had to do everything in 10 minute bouts, but now we know every single minute we do counts towards that 150 minutes and we get health benefits from doing these. Even going up the stairs once burns so many more calories than taking the elevator. It's also recommended that we partake in muscle strengthening activities. And it doesn't mean that we have to be power lifting all the time. Body weight activities are great. We've got to make sure that we're also keeping up with that musculoskeletal aspects of our health as well. And then for children, children need more activity. It's recommended that children ages six to 18 get 60 minutes every single day. So I think we need to do better about that. I know that again, physical education is a great opportunity and even recess at younger ages to maintain these 60 minutes and sports a great opportunity as well. And even for these age groups, we should also be promoting muscle strengthening activities, probably sticking more towards body weight until that it's safe enough for them to partake in more kind of lifting weights. But even things like climbing a jungle gym, that's a muscle strengthening activity. So these are kind of what's recommended 
So it's kind of good to know the general public may not be aware, but this is what the CDC recommends in terms of activity per week or per day. And it sounds like it's going to be really important in the world that we're living in now when it's virtual learning. Absolutely. So, we're not just sitting at a computer all day long. Right, right. Definitely. Get like up. a lot of us are doing. Right. Absolutely. Very good point, Katie. So why are, are these recommended guidelines so important? There are so many benefits of physical activity, but probably the most important for a lot of people would be this weight control. As you get older, it's recommended or suggested that from the ages 25 to 50, the average American gains two pounds per year. So we can kind of control that a little bit better by being more active. And a lot of times we pay attention a little bit better to what we're eating as well. That can be very effective in keeping our weight at a healthy level. There's also tons of research out there suggesting that meeting these recommended guidelines, you're at a reduced risk of all cause, all cause morbidity and mortality. So for example, you're at a lower risk of developing a cardiovascular disease, which is the number one reason for death in this country. Also, it can help prevent and even manage type two diabetes and can prevent you from being diagnosed with certain types of cancers, such as cervical, renal cancers. There's lots of different benefits from that perspective. Also, some, a fun fact here, physical activity is a great way to improve your bone density. It's been shown to be more effective than calcium. You, th you think about drinking a glass of milk. That really doesn't work, but these bone strengthening activities, jumping, walking, running, that puts, puts stress on your bones, which really helps create more dense bones, which can prevent against things like osteoporosis. But our main focus today will be on these last category of benefits, enhanced mental health. So first we need to define what mental health is. And mental health gets a bad rap, I think. Whenever we think about mental health, what we really think about are mental health problems or mental illnesses, like anxiety and depression. But we want mental health. Mental health means that we have clarity, that we have psychological well-being, that we're kind of in tune with our emotions, we're able to really say what we mean, we're able to think clearly and really live a normal, whatever normal means life for us, right? We're a functioning member of society, you probably heard that term before. And that's something that we should all want. So one benefit of being physically active is that we can be closer to that mental health end of the spectrum. And one main thing is anxiety. Again, this would be it could be classified as a mental health problem. And even at clinical levels, it can be very harmful for people where it really kind of interrupts their normal functioning, where they have these feelings of worriness, where they can't think clearly, where they're always kind of worried that something bad's gonna happen so much that some of these individuals even avoid situations. They'd rather be by themselves so they, if they can control what happens then, or, those are very severe cases. But normal anxiety is just defined as how you react to something stressful. And everyone has some sort of stress, especially now I'm sure there's lots more anxiety in the world, but it's becoming more of an issue. Over the past 10, 15 years, we've really understood anxiety better and we know it is a main issue. About 20% of American adults experience anxiety so bad it's crippling where they really should be on medication or maybe even going through therapy for it. And in children, we're seeing earlier and earlier that these habits, these symptoms are really hindering our youth. So about one third of American children experience these symptoms very severely. Wow. But we also know there's a lot of research out there showing that especially aerobic activity, so activities such as running, jogging, cycling, swimming, these activities are sometimes even better than traditional treatments like pharmaceutical drugs, which also have a hefty price tag a lot of times, some harmful side effects, some include weight gain, moodiness, they can really kind of make you think differently, but aerobic activity could really be a good alternative. So again, thinking about those activities, there's been some research showing that even five minutes can make us reduce our anxiety for up to four hours. So that's much more 
we like that instant gratification. So absolutely very beneficial, especially again, focusing on those more aerobic based activities. And I like that point because, you know, when I think of exercise, I think of I've got to go to the gym and I've right. got to get on the machine and I got to, you know, do all that. But really, like you said, it's just taking a walk around the block or, absolutely. you know, you don't have to do it hardcore or anything. Just get outside and just um, walk for five minutes to 30 minutes. So that's really nice to know. Absolutely, yeah, five minutes. Anyone can find five minutes in your day. Right. It really kind of, again, kind of relaxes you, kind of blows off some steam. So right. I really think that pe more people need to know that. Right, and I think it's a dual benefit because you're physically moving, you know, even if yeah. it's just a walk around the building or a walk around in your backyard, um, especially if we're doing, since we're doing digital learning right now, yeah. um, it helps you physically, but then also, of course, the mental health. So yeah, that's really absolutely. nice to know. If you know you've got a big test coming up, we know these effects last for multiple hours. Take some time before. Just clear your head, take a little walk, and you'll feel much better going into a test because that can be a stressful situation for lots of people. Absolutely. And another main mental health disorder would be depression. So it's normal to feel sad from time to time. But depression is this sadness so severe where it can last for multiple years where people just kind of never really feel happy, which is, I can't imagine just feeling that way for such a long period of time, but it affects a lot of people this way. So it's normal to have these kind of highs and lows in the course of a day, a week, a month. But again, depression is just this constant sadness where a lot of times it's coupled with this feelings of work, worthlessness where like you feel like you're not worthy and nothing really interests you anymore. You don't feel like if it was safe to go out with your friends, hang out with them, go to shopping if that's something that you enjoy, just things that you used to like to do just really don't interest you anymore and you really can't explain why. So learning more and more about depression as well. There's also different depressive disorders, but a lot of these have these similar characteristics where just kind of lethargic very slow moving, don't feel like doing too much. And it can even Im impact you from an educational perspective where it's hard for you to really focus on the task at hand. And this leads to even more guilt. You feel like you should be doing better and it's hard, it's really hard to get out of this cycle where just constantly getting down on yourself. And just like with anxiety, when this is very severe and it's about 20% of the adult population, they really have issues where there's not just a physical toll, but it also can be an economic toll. The mental health issues are the second most economic burden, burdensome disorder in the country after cardiovascular disease. And we know that there's many people, it's not abnormal at all for adults to be like an antidepressant. But again, we know that physical activity can be beneficial for these individuals. We know like with anxiety, we said aerobic, but for depressive disorders, it seems like any type of activity can be beneficial. So if I know things like CrossFit are becoming more popular. I mean, yoga has been really shown to help with depression as well. So in comparison with our anxiety disorders, for depressive disorders, or even just symptoms of depression, if we're feeling sad, we know that, again, being active really can be beneficial and a lot of times cheaper to some of the other alternatives. Are anxiety and depression, do they connect in any way or are they kind of completely separate? So it could be both. So I wrote here comorbidity and that just means that comorbidity means multiple diseases at the same time. So a lot of times they do couple together. It's not uncommon for individuals to be diagnosed with both an anxiety and a depressive disorder, but sometimes they can also happen on their own. And thank you for bringing this up. Depress depression in, in particular, since this long time sadness, these people put a lot of stress on the body. So they're at an in increased risk of being diagnosed with another disorder, another disease. So these people, a lot of times do have cardiovascular diseases or can even have a stroke. It gets so severe, their depression. Mm. And then shifting gear to more of these sociological benefits, this kind of vague term of social support. What social support means is that just you're caring about others, which is, I feel like, especially 
in this time of more using technology, I feel like sometimes this can be lacking. So I think this is really important to discuss. So if just caring for someone it really makes them feel better and can make you feel better as well. And this idea of social support can come in many different ways. So let's take a look at some different examples. So the first type of support is what's called instrumental. And that's when we're providing practical, tangible assistance. So giving a friend a ride, spotting them during a lift in the gym, anything where we're physically giving them something, getting them groceries. That's a good example of that instrumental type of support. And then we have emotional. And this one's pretty straightforward based off the type of support. It's just those telling people that we care about them, asking if there's something we can do for them, making sure that their emotional needs are being met. And again, right now, I feel we need more encouragement. We need more caring, more empathy. We could all do better, I feel, about empathizing with one another, putting yourself in their shoes, trying your best to understand their perspective, and really listening. I think that's something important for us to do better at. Then we have informational, our third type of social support. So to giving directions, so giving advice. So that one's pretty straightforward as well from an exercise perspective. Maybe this comes from a coach, a physical education teacher, maybe our parents even kind of give us the support. Our peers really can help us as well, kind of show us what to do, kind of model behaviors for us. And then the last one is what's called appraisal support. So that's just letting them know that their feelings are valid. So if you went for a walk and the next day you're really sore, well, you can say that that's happened to you before and let them know that it's gonna decrease over time as this becomes more of a habit and just letting them know that they're not alone. So I think that these are really important for us to understand that there's different types of support and different people need different types of support for that needs to be met. Maybe someone really needs more emotional support. So understanding that we can make sure that those needs are being met so they can be happier as well. And I think you nailed it when you said, you know, being more empathetic, especially yes. in the times that we're in right now, um, because we're all going through, you know, whether we're working, working from home or there's, you know, um, doing classes, teaching, um, everybody has some sort of empathy because they've gone through it at Absolutely. least, you know, in earlier in the year and even continue today. Yeah. And with that, I think comes patience, right? And right. understanding and letting their side be heard. So I think that's something that it's a skill that can be built and definitely important mm -hmm. as you get older, it becomes I feel, even more important. Absolutely. And then where's the support coming from is also important. So if it's coming from the family, what the research tells us is that active parents can mean active kids as well. If you grow up in a household where your parents really put emphasis on physical activity, you're gonna be more likely to do it. You're wanna, we model after our parents. So if your parents are doing these healthy behaviors, you're gonna be more likely to do it as well. And a lot of times the research also indicates that kids who are active become active adults. So learning these behaviors at a young age can mean a lifetime of physical activity, which is something that we want. Because a lot of people have good intentions. You think about like New Year's resolutions, people, have that goal of losing weight. And they start to go to the gym, and then a month later, the gym is empty. So again, instilling these behaviors at an early age really can be very beneficial. Also from significant others, so from a husband, a wife, maybe an aunt, an uncle, if you're doing these activities together, you're more likely to do it. You have that accountability. You have someone to do it with, or maybe if you're not doing the same activity, just still providing that support. Again, that emotional support, letting them know that they're doing a great job, that you see that they're more mentally stable, that they're losing the weight that they wanted. So that could be that showing that caring can also be a way that our significant others provide that support. And then instrumental sport, support in particular, think about youth sport. Well, parents are the ones that sign kids up that take them to games, that buy them the gear that they need. 
that pay their monthly dues. So those are some good examples of how that instrumental support is really important, especially from those parents or guardians. And then from our peers, we like people that are like us. Those are the people that we're naturally attracted to. So if we are looking out for a youth sport team or an exercise group, we're gonna pick people about the same age as us and typically about the same ability level as well. That's what's really more important to us. So if we wanna sign up and we see people who are 10 years older than us, that's not something that we'll be attracted to. Again, we really like people who are more like us. That's what will group that'll be more important for us. I agree, yeah. I agree with that, Dr. Dasinger, because yeah. when I went to UT Martin, um, yeah. I went to the, the student rec center and they had all these, I don't really like to exercise by myself because I really don't know how to use all the machines, yeah. but I loved the group classes because they were all of my age. And then, yeah. you know, it was that accountability. So yeah. finding a, a youth sport or a dance class or, Absolutely. you know, a joggers club or anything. Yeah. I think if you do have that, um, that group accountability, I think that's more motivating too. Cause you've got friends that are like, Hey, you come into practice tonight or Hey, you come into the cycling yep. class tonight. So I think that's great. Yeah. That's a great point. Again, finding these people that are kind of like-minded, it really can be beneficial for everyone. And maybe different people provide these different types of support for you. You're two people beginning at the same point. They can kind of help appraise themselves, validate their experiences. So absolutely. And then lastly, we have this idea of social facilitation. And this means basically, well, when we're around others, when people are watching us, we're gonna work a little bit harder. So if we go to the gym and we're on a treadmill and someone comes onto the treadmill next to us, it's very common for us to look at what they're doing and maybe do, maybe they're at seven miles per hour, we're gonna go to 7.1. Right, <laughs> just a it's little just bit better. Thing. Absolutely. It's human nature. Mm -hmm. And there's been some really interesting research studies that show when even like running on a trail, if we see people kind of walking their dog, we speed up when we pass them just so we look better, which has nothing to do with anything. Right. Except what we do. That a little bit of competitiveness, maybe. Absolutely. So in summary, we know there's so many benefits of being physically active. There's different physical benefits like that weight control, reduced risk of different diseases and disorders, but there's also lots of mental health benefits. So what's suggested is typically about 30 minutes a day. So that's pretty doable, finding that time and make sure that we're doing it safely. And our goal really is either that an hour a day, and again, it doesn't have to be a continuous hour, finding little bouts throughout the day, as long as we're getting to that total amount. And then what we know about support, make sure our needs are being met. Again, different people need different types of support. Maybe if we're just starting out, we need more informational support. We need to know what to do. And we also need that emotional support. People telling us that we're doing a good job. Think about if you played sport growing up. It made you feel really good when a coach tells you you're doing a good job or they're proud of you. So we know that when our needs are met, it really makes us feel better about ourselves and increases our confidence and then we'll be more motivated to keep this lifestyle of physical activity up. So any questions? Yes, I do have some questions. And first of all, thank you for that presentation. That was great. Um, I've always heard, you know, you have to have some rest days between exercising. So, cause like sometimes I would always think, okay, I want to walk on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday is my rest day. But then we, then I just, when I listen to your presentation, you do encourage 30 minutes of exercise every day. So are there any rest days or should we just walk or run or whatever for 30 minutes every day? Yeah, I think it kind of depends on your goal. So if you're just trying to maintain kind of like your weight control or yeah, maybe having a couple of rest days will be important. And obviously this doesn't want to, I don't want this to be something overwhelming where you feel like it has to be necessity, but we do know that doing something a little bit every day, just this idea of living a more active lifestyle, we know that's beneficial because we're have really bad sedentary habits where 
like binge watching Netflix where you're sitting there for six hours at a time. We know that's not healthy. Even if we are getting those 30 minutes sitting for six hours, it really kind of kind of contradicts that activity we did. So maybe if 30 minutes is too long, we still know that even 15 minutes a day is still beneficial for us. So it doesn't have to be 30 minutes every single day, but we're just trying to get do as much as we can. Right. Well, thank you for that answer. Absolutely. If you want to um, stop sharing your screen, and I've got a couple more questions for you. Um, so we talked about anxiety yes. um, and, and the symptoms and everything. So is it normal to experience symptoms of anxiety? 100%. Everyone experiences anxiety every now and again. So like I mentioned, before a test, it's normal to feel nervous. Before a big match, a big game, you're probably going to have those butterflies in your stomach, those feelings of nervousness. It's absolutely normal. But some people just feel these symptoms all the time without any explanation. And that's that 20% of the adult population, 30% for children, that really can extremely benefit from these physical activities. But if you feel this way, again, it's totally normal. And there's a lot of things we can do to help you. Perfect. And then, of course, my big question, because I can identify with this one too, yeah. is it ever too late to start exercising? Never, never, never too late. <laughs> we, there's a lot of research studies that show that people, middle-aged adults who never exercised before in their mid 40s, 50s, they get the same benefits where they can kind of reverse some of the bad habits and they still get that re reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, improved mental health. So it's never too late. So if you're listening to this and you don't know how to start, there's lots of resources out there that really encourage you to start being active. Awesome. Do you have any websites that we could go to or does UT Martin have a, a physical activity website or anything? So you can go to the CDC. The CDC does a lot of information. They have the obesity statistics and with that they have some resources about diet and physical activity that are really great, very kind of succinct, get to the point, very attractive graphics. So I think that would be my number one resource to share. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Dasinger, for taking the time and doing this. And thank you to our viewers today for joining us. Uh, we look forward to continuing our mission here at Discovery Park with UT Martin um, about inspiring children and adults to see beyond. For more educational resources, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com slash education. Thank you.